through those as well. You want to just move those to a future sure, agenda? Future. Yeah. They're pretty lengthy. Yeah. John won't have that many with them probably. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will go ahead and call this meeting to order. This is the regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council Finance Committee meeting uh, committee. Today is Tuesday, November 15th, 2022, and it is 405 p.m. Uh, let the record show that um, present are John Anderson and myself, um, as Councillor Johnson has moved on from the council. And so temporarily it is just the two of us. Um, available for the meeting. Item three is approval of the minutes from September 20th, 2022. Can I get a motion? So I will second. Uh, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Um, action item four is, I'm sorry, item four is an action item um, rescinding bond authority. And this is something that Tom yep. prepared for us. Yeah, let me provide some background. Um, Periodically, councils have been asked to do this and have, have done it. Uh, essentially, uh, there's any number of reasons that um, bond authority, previously granted bond authority, uh, is no longer necessary. And uh, the last time we did this uh, was back in October of 2015. And it was, a, it was over $4.3 million in various projects, but the total was about $4.3 million that was rescinded. Uh, so what you're seeing here is a list of projects. Uh, it kind of spans a full decade from uh, FY uh, 50 year 2008 all the way through 18. And it lists a total of 36 different um, projects or items, again, all of which have um, existing bonding authority associated with them. And the, the far right-hand column um, is kind of a cryptic description as to why we no longer need to borrow these monies. Uh, so the first grouping, I think there's seven in total. Uh, the project's complete. You'll see if uh, the project came in under the, uh, the authority granted. So we simply don't, we'll never need to bond that. Uh, the middle category, which is the largest, is about 24 items. Um, uh, in recent years, we've been receiving significant bond premium. These are additional monies that the purchaser of our bond would pay up front. I don't profess to understand why that makes sense to them, but they do. And so we've been able to use premium to pay for items we would have otherwise um, bothered doing. And uh, the final category are duplicates. I don't know exactly why, but obviously we had we have doubled the authorization on those uh, last five projects. So all of these projects, for one reason or another, um, we no longer need uh, this bond authority granted to us. And this will help us kind of clean up the books. We're continually has to continue to track this, and uh, that's really a housekeeping matter, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we can expect we should do this maybe a little more frequently than every ten years, but uh, we can expect uh, you know, life happens and, and things don't match up uh, exactly with what really are estimated amounts as part of the budget process. So I, I, I would uh, look for your support of this, and I'd like to put it on the next. Uh, council agenda for their their action. Uh, so if we move through this. Is there, is there any like practical effect of rescinding this at this point that it could have, or is it really just kind of housekeeping clean up? Well, we do for reporting purposes have to continually report uh, authority that we have, and I think this makes sense uh, if we have no expectation of ever needing that to remove that. I don't know that it has a drag on our financials uh, necessarily, but I think it's just good housekeeping. Okay. Do we? I was I was talking to Councilor Pucci, Pucci the other day about a list like this. Mm -hmm. Is it such an easy thing to produce? That's not just that that also kind of goes beyond this list, but just all of our bond activity and what's active. Because he was suggesting he was looking for something like this, and he had said it's been a challenge to find it. I just don't know. I don't know if this is exactly what he was yeah, looking for. Yeah, talking about. Um... We certainly have it by bond issue, but each of those issues may have 50 items associated with them. No, I, I'm, I'm certain Luke has the detail that supports each and every one. Okay. So I guess if you'd be clear what you're looking for, I can be responsible to that. Request. Okay. Because I, I saw this in the packet and I was just thinking, like, is that what he's looking for? But just more of the holistic list. And I just don't know. 
to your point, like it might be much more exhausted than what this looks like. Like this might be easy to go yeah. forward. Yeah, I think I'm, think I'm looking at something similar. The, the first grouping is essentially this list, and then it's the other bond. Okay. These are all uh, existing bond authority. Some of them, some of which have not been used yet. Mm -hmm. Not to that point. Um, so let me work through it. I'll provide okay. this, and maybe that will spawn some further conversation yeah. and, and uh, interest. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Okay. Yeah. Great, and, and thank you to Ruth for going through and identifying items that mm -hmm. were relevant to this conversation. So, um, do I have a motion to, to, uh, to recommend that this go to the council? I move that we recommend that this go to the council at the next town council meeting. I will second that. All those in favor? Thank Great. You. Great, thank you, Tom. Yep. Item five for tonight, uh, we have two items up for discussion this evening. Um, one is a continued discussion of our financial and fiscal policy. Um, if you will recall at a previous meeting, we had established a Google sheet that the committee was, at the, at, that was available to the full council. Um, specifically, we had um, alerted the committee to the sheet and only John, <laughs> populated the sheet. I admittedly, I still <laughs> stuck homework. to my uh, pen and paper notes. Um, and so I, I think that the, the uh, staff has begun to address the questions that you did put in there. And so I think that that's a great place uh, for us to launch our discussion from. Um, for anyone who's watching or counselors who um, are still interested, this is going to be an ongoing discussion. I don't anticipate that we're going to wrap up a full review of this policy today. Um, and so certainly um, we'll keep that document live and um, whatever we don't get to today, um, people can continue to populate that with, with questions. Mm -hmm. And so if we jump right in. Yeah, that would be that would be great. Mm -hmm. What's going to serve your purpose best to kind of work right from the top right down through? That seems reasonable to me. I, I'm assuming that I did the same thing. I I put page numbers with mine. Um, and then, John, could you just kind of go through um, in chronological order through the yeah. policy? Yeah, so like what we talked about, um, we could talk about like where we had questions. Yep. And then just after reading it, some general recommendations that are more conversations probably for this committee to debate and explore further if any of these recommendations are are worth pursuing. Yep. So again, I think my first one was really just around an ask, I think, that actually you you put forward, Councillor Seifer, that would be just helpful yep. for this committee going forward to have like at the beginning of the year a clear calendar that says these are to be in compliance with policy and some of the review things. Yep what we need to review this next year just so that we don't lose sight of it. I mean, it's all in the policy, but you know, some of the things that we're supposed to review are either annually or every two years or three years. And so I don't know when's the last time it had its official review to say, is this the year we need to do the review of the, um, I think the investment policy was like every three years or something. So it's like just making sure the committee knows what's on deck and what's required for the year and just kind of almost even like pre-populating that in a, monthly calendar of if we're going to follow the policy to the to the T, these are would be the best times to put those on the agenda. I think even um, in the development process of a calendar, we would be able to get feedback from staff and saying, okay, I, I think that would be a good opportunity to recognize places in the policy that we either can or cannot meet mm -hmm. to. And so if we're looking at something and, and it's in policy that we're supposed to review it the 1st of January and staff says, well, we don't even get those reports until yeah. mm -hmm. February. So that's an indication of something that, you know, we're out of compliance with our policy and, and that is an easy enough fix that we just need to shift the timeline. Um, and so I would love to um, see the creation of that calendar um, carried through. I just think it would keep everybody on track and it also helps when, um, many members change over a year, you know, over the years. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff buried in the in the text. Uh, it's, uh, it's not readily apparent. Yeah. yeah. You read it through and I'm like, I think there's like 10 things in there, but then it's like, yeah, so I think just having some recurring thing like that just help, I would be helpful. 
Um, the next one for me was just, again, just the, it wasn't clear. And I think because we were going through this policy, especially during the time of the library, like does this policy have any purview over the school, the library and SEDCO? The things that are not town governing and if they aren't, I guess my question was, well, how, how do we apply a policy, especially if we're issuing debt for a project and what's our, our um, responsibility as a, as a town and as a council versus maybe like school has a separate fiscal policy. I don't know if they do, I'm assuming they do. And so are those in alignment and in sync? And are we clear, especially when we have other big bonds coming forward, which is the governing policy that we need to be holding ourselves accountable to? It just didn't like pop out to me that this policy covered it all, or that was my assumption reading it. And so I just said, I thought that's the case, we need to be clear, but seeing Ruth's comment, it sounds like it's not that, that simple. Yeah, certainly. Um, I, I believe the school applies here. The school is technically a town department, and you know their fund balance shows in hours, so on and so forth. Um, when it comes to borrowing and you know, kind of debt management, um, I think it applies universally. I mean, the council is the one who controls that process, mm -hmm. and we're the ones who pay the bonds. How they actually make their investments, uh, and set for the library, I think those are probably not addressed and not applied. Mm -hmm. Don't aren't applicable in this case. Uh, but it's a fair point. You know, yeah, it's clear what it, who, the, who the policy and what the policy applies to. Mm -hmm. and, and then my next one was again just kind of as I was reading it. I think some of this came about because of you know you don't really know these things until they happen. And so that I, I think if we weren't in the process or weren't in the process of looking for a finance director, I we wouldn't have known, noticed this gap. But like again, or should we have language in there? That better aligns that while the finance director is maybe the um, primary responsible person for executing the policy in, in the case of absence, it's de facto the town manager or the finance somebody just to make sure it's clear that hey, just because we don't have a finance director doesn't mean there isn't clarity on who's got authority. My my assumption is it's been quiet. It's, it's not it's not an authority, it's ability as uh, well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here. Yeah, <laughs> or deputy finance. Yeah. We have a deputy finance director, so I don't know yeah. if that's like the next in line, but just yeah. being clear on on some language there. And again, I think there there's some specific examples later on in my questions, which I again we don't have to go through the detailed questions because those are more some of that was for my edification. But you know, just in general, I felt like as I was reading it, I was like, well, this is the finance director is responsible, but I was like, well, why couldn't it be? The finance committee chair and some places the town manager's name so just getting cleaner on who should be accountable for some of the things that are in there and just question and align that those are really the right individuals like what should the elected official or the finance committee chair be accountable for because it was mentioned in there a couple of times but again should it be more should it be less same thing for where we're just assigning accountability that was something to, to revisit more more deeply um again i'm i'm an advocate for this i know that the practicality of it is, is going to be a challenge but coming from our um bond advisor when they specifically talked about you know ideally to like maintain our our health they had suggested when we were having the review that we should consider moving our unassigned fund balance higher so again i think that's just something for the committee to explore it. But is it worth going up or should we stay? Or again, that's probably something that should be discussed frequently, like yeah. annually or something to see what's what's practical. And looks like Ruth says we should shoot for two months instead of one month. So yeah, you see for her to say she yeah, I know. <laughs> we'll say, yeah. I know the I know it's I think not that easy. there's well I think there's some, some some education piece to that too. I mean if we're if it's just a line item, you know, that and and it's that easy target every year after year when we're trying to get below a certain, you know, percent rate, I think that it's easy to just keep kicking that can. And but I don't know that necessarily the whether it's the committee needs to be committed to that and and really having having the bond guy come and explain why that is such a key component um, certainly informed my decision on 
you know, moving forward, what I would, yeah, what it, I would, it, it matters that with, line your, item. with your bond ratings. Yeah. And um, a financial advisor was able to quantify what it would mean if we were to increase it to X. He was giving a qualified opinion whether or not it would get us to the next rating and what would that mean in terms of interest rate savings. And there was a fairly lackluster return. Yeah. Uh, it was fairly painful to do for fairly little return, as I recall, but I could be a little clearer about that. Um, and as, as the chairperson said, um, you know, this, this town has had an over, I say, fixation on tax rate and yeah. at the expense of building fund balance. As we get budgets that are tighter and tighter, there's not year in surplus. Mm -hmm. I will say we are in a position over the next two or three fiscal years be building significant, helping our fund fundamental position by way of the hydro parkway debt. That's been a drag. That's about a three million dollar number that's not shown for positive right now. That is uh, the hydro parkway tip continues to perform well, and we satisfy the CDA obligations this year. Final partial payments due. All of that money will be directed to paying off the deficit and final debt. That's dollar for dollar increase to a fund balance. So by virtue of that, over the next two or three fiscal years, we're going to see a probably a two million dollar benefit mm -hmm. to our uh, fund balance uh, without doing anything else. Mm -hmm. So that's good in the near term. But it's a it's a conversation point that we need to continue to have for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I would encourage uh, any of you to be part of the rating agency calls. These are the three analysts that are looking deep deep dive in our financials. And the ones that are recommending to a, uh, a committee of sorts uh, to decide our final bond rating. Um, those are very interesting calls. Yeah. Some, of the, mm -hmm. some of the smartest people I've ever associated with other than those calls um, just have an innate ability to focus on the strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. um, you learn a lot yeah. in that process. And if that is, are they like talking specifically about our yes. position? Yep. I think that would be interesting. I'm wondering, mm -hmm. like, are those. Um, it seems like that's something that this committee would actually be interested in sure. doing. Because again, I just felt past chairs have been yeah. active participants, not the full membership. Mm -hmm. There's no reason we can't be part of it. Yeah. We sit in this room and have a conference call with our advisor and we get to rate the agencies. Yeah, I think that, that would just be yeah. helpful as a means of just understanding. Because yep. I, I honestly felt like having the advisor come is probably yep. one of the best <laughs> financial overviews we've gotten in terms of our health. And so I guess if that's kind of the similar vibe, but doing it, yeah. you know, again and again, I think that's always helpful. Okay. Um, I, Councillor Johnson, actually, my next one brought that up, I think, at one point. And again, it, it's not always clear to me. Like sometimes when you have audits, they look at management controls and I don't know if we ever ask specifically to look at or how they evaluate our fiscal policy and compliance with the fiscal policy, more as like our own internal, like tell us how we're doing, are we following it the way we should be doing it and getting an outside opinion. So I don't know if that's something that we have within scope of the new auditors when they're doing their audit, but I feel like that would be interesting to consider, like to make sure that we're not only is this committee kind of auditing it. Some degree, but like getting a third party opinion. Yeah, I think we need to retain some additional services. To, I don't believe that that would be within the traditional right. scope of the independent audit, but um, I don't speak for that, but I'm quite sure we could probably make arrangements for them to, and they might need to be in a position to give us some advice how to right. uh, simplify right. or, yeah. or streamline or however you want to characterize yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good thorough policy, but it is like you're kind of jumping around. So I think that's where. Somebody who does this for a living can probably look at it and be like, can make better connections yeah. than maybe we can. Yeah, and one of the reasons it's clunky, there used to be four different standalone policies that were kind of jammed together. So it doesn't flow really tremendously well, and, and each of them are very dense. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a lot there. Yeah. So my last one I added five minutes ago, which was maybe <laughs> we need to add language about specifically about rescinding bond authority, just the I think Carmen just said it, like you probably need to okay. add some language about how and when and how often we do it, not every 10 years, but yeah. every five or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. simple enough. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and to, again, jumping back to that calendar idea, just getting it on a schedule mm -hmm. um, so that we know it's coming. So those are kind of, well, those were like my big 
picture ideas. The rest, again, was more for clarification. So I haven't had a chance to look at the responses yet. Okay. So if you want to go through them, we can, but, or we can, if there's anything, Councilor Piper, big picture for you that you want to share. I mean, you hit, you hit my big picture questions. Um, I think later on in the document, there's a, there's a point. I want to make sure that we talk about the language around capital improvement budget versus capital improvement plan and just mm -hmm. make sure that we address that. But let's see what, if we just go in order here. Yeah. So the first questions are related to debt management. And this might be a little tricky to see. But then this is just an interest in how we maintain good communications. And I guess it sounds like Congress. Yeah. Every time we, go to, we, we need to update our, uh, we choose to update our bond rating every time. Uh, unless that's a requirement, um, but we, we do. So we engage them um, almost every year, frankly. As mm -hmm. part of that, we do have very direct communications with them. And I, as a matter of course, I do share the, uh, there's a report that typically comes from the rating agency that will provide kind of the strengths and weaknesses, kind of an overview and rationale for why they, uh, why they split the rating where they did. So I would say yes, we do. Mm -hmm. And there's a link here that you can see um, the most recent document. Moody's and Standard and Poor's. And yeah, I just want to see the date on it. Yeah, well, I think that would be the last time we did. So this is just an example of one of the two we use standard and fours that's what this is and also Moody's. Uh, they both have kind of their own uh, preferences, if you will, in terms of how they establish their rating methodologies and preferences. Moody's one can is heavily weighted towards fund balance. That's that's uh, right. as a from a methodological point of view, that's uh, something they highly value. Standard and fours is more interested in some of the underlying economics, the socioeconomics of the community, the percentage of you know, property tax rate collection, um, growth factors, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And again, the bond rating is all about uh, establishing or assessing the risk to the bondholder, if you will. And, uh, and also giving them the assurance that going forward, the community is in good position and they're not going to default in the bonds. And all of the important metrics, I think Joe, our financial advisor, gave an interesting little overview with little bubble gut diagrams that Ray did really how we stacked up and we were kind of off the chart on most of the important categories. I can share that back out with you. Mm -hmm. What was the next one? So I think there's a lot of words here. Yeah, the, <laughs> next, the next two go together. So yeah. it was really about to me, this might be a recommendation more than I was gonna say this to me, I think is big picture yeah. conversation. It, the challenge was again when we got some feedback on the interpretation of our fiscal policy. Yeah. Some people interpreted when something should happen different than after I read it when it should happen. And so just making sure we're clear when some of the items that we say we're going to execute happen happen. Because again, my my when you read it as a whole and take a step back, it really makes it clear to me that. A lot of the requirements happen prior to the issuance of the debt, not necessarily prior to a decision to go on a referendum or anything like that. Right. But I think for a lot of the public, when they read it, I could see how they could easily interpret it that, hey, this should have happened before the council moved it forward. We should have known certain things before. And that's just kind of what I um, felt like going into this and reading it was that, again, there should be tighter language to make it clear on the timing of when these things happen, because it wasn't called out specifically that I think would have kind of avoided some of that um, confusion. Yeah, the staff recommends uh, as part of the capital budget process, um, the method of finance. Um, we typically uh, don't go so far as to um, differentiate, you know, the length of term and so on and so forth right. as part of that process. But when we do go to issue, all of that has to be done. Mm -hmm. And there's some decision points to be made. Um, the general rule of thumb is you don't want to um, 
borrow money for an item uh, that extends beyond its useful life, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just simple one. Um, and, and so there's some choices made, and on occasion, more often than not, I've brought those decisions, if time allows, to the finance committee to say, we have different options here. Well, let's talk about them. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I think a lot of those decisions are made. Yeah. It's, right. It's, it's at the time of issuance. Yeah. Right. And I recall, I don't remember doing it this year, but I do recall at one point Ruth coming, having that conversation with the committee, and then an action went in front of the council based on the recommendation of the committee to move her recommendation for it. It might have come like when we're doing all of the bonding yeah. and bucketing it, where again, to me, that was kind of that's the point where we should be doing a lot of the metrics reviews and making sure that, okay, assuming we take that recommendation, what does that mean? Again, I can't remember that meeting. I just yeah. remember we had something sure. like that. I do remember that, that's often, that is very time sensitive. Once we go to competitive bid, we'll have mm -hmm. four, six, eight, sometimes 10 bidders. And there's options. Um, those are typically time bound uh, with a very short turnaround. Um, just the bond markets change daily. So, you know, we don't have weeks, we have days at best. So if, if the calendar works out, and I'm able to get in front of the finance today, I have no meeting. And the bigger questions recently have been uh, around bond premium. Do we want it? If so, what are we going to do with it? Um, so um, I'm, I'm fine if the policy is clear in terms of when these decision points Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think visible. that's I think that's the the take home message on that piece was just the feedback that we had gotten, um, and even a, as a committee member, you know, we had to we went back and forth just to say, are we in violation of the policy? Mm -hmm. You know, I I'm not sure, and and so I think just clarifying that um, certain steps of the policy take place after a referendum but before issuance, or yeah. it might even be good. To like, like uh, with on the line of the calendar concept, like an appendix that like maps out like steps and the timing and what happens at the steps mm -hmm. for bond issuance and how the policy applies or where it applies, just to make sure that it's clear, like a, a just more like a, a summary that just shows that this is how it applies in a more practical way. That again help the committee, but also help the public have a better sense of where are we in the process. Like if we're just talking about um, whether we want to put something to referendum, you know, it needs to be on the CIP and the capital improvement budget too, right? So it's like there, there's a couple of things that, that need to happen, um, but we don't really get to the metrics review until this point, just to kind of like make it more of like a clear path of what, what needs to happen this policy just a suggestion mm -hmm. again i think it goes back to like you're reading different parts in different places mm -hmm. and so you're trying to pull those pieces together yourself and it would just be nice to have it all together and then i think we learned a lot from the library referendum um progression that happened over the last 10 months um in terms of you know, were they are are they following a set policy, and and if so, can we point to it and identify exactly the steps that were taken to get them to where they were, or is this just kind of standard practice? And mm -hmm. if there is a standard practice, can we quantify that? Like, yeah. So it's it's part of that that more global conversation because we're always going to have um, CIP items that are yeah. going to need to go to referendum. And so if we can streamline that process and just communicate it really clearly, then everybody's mm -hmm. on the same page. Hopefully. And that's a really great point because I know the school has asked yeah. oh, okay. what's the process. And I was like, well, read our fiscal policy and <laughs> <laughs> that should guide you. Um, but I, but what I tried to do was kind of give my interpretation and maybe some key milestones that are aligned with our budget that we just need to make sure that they cover certain things, which might be something for this committee to like really focus on because I know the financial pieces are going to be super important. Um, but just being clear on, you know, what are the, to your point, like what's the process and the milestones and the gates they need to meet 
to make sure that they can move through the process appropriately so that when we go to um, issue the, or when the referendum question actually comes forward to the council, we can say, at least from a fiscal policy perspective, we've checked all the boxes and they've done everything. Um, so yeah, I think that was, a, that was a good learning from the library. It kind of left this questioning of, did we skip anything? I don't think we did, but it wasn't mapped out clearly for us to be able to kind of evaluate and say, yep, they they followed all the, the steps. It strikes me the library project was probably a, a poster child. I mean, there was so much line of sight into that. Um, you know, it was well documented for decades coming up to this. Mm -hmm. You know, it was prominent in our flyways facility plan in 2015 and 16, made it into the capital plan for almost that entire time as well, just kind of always in the out years. Mm -hmm. And then as they got closer and funded some of the more um, detailed due diligence in terms of, you know, floor plan and, and mm -hmm. schematic design and so on and so forth, you know, it, it rose to the point, it got to the point that it was worthy of council of public consideration. Mm -hmm. So I think that that really is a good example. Yeah. Yep. Um, I don't know that we can always have that extended line of sight into a, something coming at us. Mm -hmm. True. Um, I think the challenge might have been because of the COVID year and the stop. Is it, I think COVID with the starts and stops, maybe for a lot of the big capital projects. Well, council, people, like, yeah, remember at council, yeah. I think in that's like 21, um, council had a budget okay. goal of no, no big no, capital. Yeah. Yeah. So we basically stiff on them. For yeah. yeah. I yeah. think it would have been almost a year earlier mm -hmm. had you not. That's true. We did do that. I think it, I was we did. That. I was well, I think we didn't know it was, <laughs> we didn't know what was coming at us. So yeah, I think yeah. it was prudent at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I think that's kind of the theme for a lot of these H four ones. So I don't know if we need to go over each one. Um, Yeah, for the lease purchase agreement, is that essentially what we did with the hub? No, there's no expectation to purchase. It's just a straight conventional lease. Okay, so it has to be, if, it, if it's more, if the intent is to lease then purchase. I, I will say, though, uh, there were significant notable changes in the charter just approved two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And what used to be limited to, or uh, really focused on issuance of, of bonds, it now is broadened to talk about uh, long-term financial obligations, which includes bonding, mm -hmm. but also uh, leasing, uh, and not necessarily lease to purchase. And it's a cumulative total. So the hub value, I don't think would even hit that threshold with the $600,000 threshold. Yeah. Now. But the intent of that was the voters ought to be interested and have a say in long-term financial commitments, whatever form. Right, right, so far, yeah. right. So I think that was that was a good broadening of that. Yeah. Okay. And clarification. Just just speaking of the charter, we probably do need the, the committee probably does at some point need to make sure that whatever yeah. is approved that has an impact. Mm -hmm. And maybe for you, Tom, yeah. I know we added the language around uh, the additional language for the audit, but also for the um is it the CIP reporting? Not just there. There are a few things that yeah, we changed. The budget submission. Yeah, the budget oh, submission, budget. which I'm sure, like, it, would it be helpful if we tried to like document what that actually meant from an execution perspective, or what would be your suggestion on how you would? Want uh, the audit's clear. I think the one or seven is clear. I still have some question in my mind. What the the capital components yeah. part yeah. of the submission. What did we set threshold for what the capital? I think you did hundred thousand um, dollars. I've got to look back at that, but that's that could be staring right at me in yeah. the next yeah. thirty days. Yeah, I'm not sure. That might be an important topic for the new finance committee, given that it's coming. It so yeah, to yep. align with you on in terms of like what what, what what's guidance actually expected here. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. You, you, yeah. Because we, we talked at length at the charter committee level and then at the council we used one of both of the workshops to talk about what does it mean. Yep. And I'm not sure if we ever landed yeah. on great clarity. I think that would be helpful to do and get you some feedback before 
throw some guidance so that you're not going to a blind and then blur or something. We're like, that's not that's what we wanted, one. <laughs> which is highly likely. So, yeah, or highly a, likely that that could I'll happen. I'll make a note yeah. uh, of that and make sure I pass that along as a future point for consideration. Mm -hmm. I think it included, there was an interesting way in kind of um, our existing capital assets that we own. That's my recollection as well. Yeah. 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 Which again, we had a lot. I think we have a lot of that in the annual report, right? So it's not. Well, there was. Well, as part of the audit, uh, this is now scheduled, which requires you to uh, provide all and, and account for all of our fixed assets. Um, that includes streets, sidewalks, rolling stock, so on, so on and so forth. Um, all of which um, is required for us to actually produce a balance sheet. Um, but four, four years ago, we would never show our net worth kind of thing. Well, there's also, I remember, some, from a pra practicality standpoint in terms of budgeting, um, we had a discussion, well, you know, a single building is going to show up on in excess of that $100,000, but there might be projects within that building that we would like to see coming that wouldn't necessarily meet that criteria. And so that was part of the teasing out yeah. of exactly what the committee was going to be looking for. Mm -hmm. I think that the theme from the Traffic Commission and the theme probably through the library discussion is we need to get a, a better um, cadence and consistency on capital planning. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of room for interpretation and collective thought and then it's over what is that mean? Mm -hmm. I think six they answered seven. That's on page seven. Um, so it was, no, what do you mean the voter proof on this section doesn't have much there on based on the library so in learning well, I thought, I think what I recall, so let me look at it now. I wasn't sure, I think it was more of like, I wasn't sure if this was supposed to kind of lay out a little bit more how we deal with voter approved. Or no, wait, this is voter approved on. So this is after the voters. Have approved the I think what was required for the voters, the voters to approve items that fall into this category, and this is the subject of that charter change. Yeah. So this clearly needs to be changed. I think it was probably more going back to my earlier comment about process and like, I guess I was looking when I got to this section that it would kind of outline a little bit what happens prior to going to the voters. Okay. And that's not what this does. This yeah. simply yeah. reports the uh, charter provision. Yeah. It doesn't provide any kind of context beyond that. Yeah. And so that's where I felt like maybe there's an opportunity because I don't okay. think anywhere else there's really no guidance, I think, in the fiscal policy around. I mean, I shouldn't say there's no guidance. There, it's in there, but it's again just not clear of process, right? Like I've, we've already talked about it, so I don't want to play it again. Okay. But the notion of like, before we get to a referendum vote, what should have happened aligned with our policy, just to make sure that we can check those boxes along the way. I can see it like being a, a little flow chart. I yeah. get yeah. something to referendum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Step step before you come to the council, do these things. Yeah, there you go. There yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can do a video talk. There you go. You do a cartoon yeah. video. Yeah. <laughs> I'm dating myself with one of those Saturday mornings. That's what I just said how a bill becomes a law. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you <Yes. laughs> You're old enough. I don't. Just as an aside, I'll just say, you know, our policy is it's just that. I mean, it's intended to be a guide. Um, it should be flexible. One of my concerns with this is it's so detailed that it, it's not very flexible. Right. Um, and there's all, at the end of the day, the town council rules supreme. Um, it has the legal authority and to pretty much do whatever you want, whatever, whatever you want. 
I'm not saying you should, but uh, I, I just maybe stating the obvious that when you, when you start to reduce things in writing the policy, you're, you start to limit your authority as well. And there may be very good reasons why you don't want to follow a lengthy process. The emergency pops up, and it is unforeseen. Mm -hmm. So, there's likely yeah. very good occasions when you violate your own policy, too, and you'll know it when you, when you should. Mm -hmm. yeah. And my next one was just, again, historical context, which, again, seems like, again, just curiously, out of curiosity, like, how did we establish those threshold, thresholds for debt limits? Which, they were honestly arbitrary. They were basically cutting in half with the statutory limits mm -hmm. to provide. I did provide a link to the government statute if you want to look at it. Um, and we did the calculation under state law. We can borrow up to 15% yeah. of our valuation, which is a staggering amount. Yeah. It's over $600 million in mm -hmm. that, which mm -hmm. uh, I think everyone is just aghast. Um, and so, Right or wrong, um, these these limits were fixed, and they're basically half of what the state law allows. Mm -hmm. I think the next one again, um, to me, this is a, I think historically, right, Tom, line twenty one, that was something that was done at a desire to build a different fund. Which I think we've over time started to put money in, but mm -hmm. we're probably not where we want to be, right? In terms of how much we actually have in there, at least in all I meant with trying to get to when this policy was put in, right. you know, the goal is to get there in 10 years. I don't know. Yeah, I think this was really just uh, committing to more of this page ago. So we have a long tradition of financing most of our capital items um, because we don't have established reserves. Right. A lot of small towns in Maine will, you know, have the fire truck reserve and won't buy the truck until we have the, you know, the fundraising is complete and, or however they, they raise the funds. We traditionally have not done that. And so this was uh, intended to commit ourselves to getting there. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of times when we've had some unexpected money, as I recall one year, we had some additional GPA um, late in the budget year. And the council decided to cap uh, against the tax rate to reduce it. Yep. And it was really for the school, and yep. the other half for the school to the reserve. Yep. And I actually budgeted it one year. I think it last year. Last year. Mm -hmm. A couple of times. I was going to say, yeah, not just the, last year, but definitely also last year. That's, yeah. one, that's one of those things that in the final analysis, yeah. it gets cut because right. it affects tax rate. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, not for lack of effort. Right. Or commitment. I, I don't know what it means. It's really, like to your point, it's really a decision for the council to say how committed are we to this concept. Yep. And I feel like if, if people had a better sense, like when did when did the, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but when did that particular policy statement get written? So that it, has it been six years, eight years? And again, where are we? Because if we're not going to commit to this, then do we need to update it in the policy? Or do we want to commit to right. it and make sure we account for that in the budget. I right. think we committed in uh, 2018 for this so four years. Yeah. And we have no progress to really point to at this point. Okay. Yeah, this one was just kind of um the equipment reserve bond. Sorry, council like no, reserve I just keep looking totally at this. Fine. So like, no, this is totally fine. Yeah. The I just don't remember us doing this. And again, it might happen more in the budget somewhere and we just don't call it out, but the concept of the equipment reserve fund and actually um, actually like doing this particular part of the policy, it just didn't, I couldn't recall myself where I felt like we did that. We're back on the one he has highlighted. Here. Yeah. But again, it's a two year, no, I think it's a two year, or no. Yeah, it's worth noting uh, also in this, uh, in the fund balance section of this same policy, um, we have aspirational goals for uh, maintaining certain fund balance. 
Mm -hmm. what I, as I recall, the bottom number is 8.3%, the target's 10%, but if it ever gets above 12%, mm -hmm. that money automatically flows to equipment to fund capital. Mm -hmm. So we, we, that's another area that just kind of overlap and, and um, you know, stating priorities that, yeah, let's build fund balance, but not forever. Um, let's use that money to help offset capital costs. Equipment is equipment defined. Like, is that a specific? Is that like computer equipment, like that type of equipment? And again, are those going to be funded through this particular reserve account versus like in the operating budgets or? Uh, it certainly could, depending uh, more often than not, um, you know, the technology request. There's a whole bunch of individual technology related items. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it could be a million dollar expense to update the school's technology. So I would say yes. The, the, the more reoccurring question is when you have those kinds of low value items that are durable, mm -hmm. you know, you know, expendable items, are they good candidates for more borrowing? Mm -hmm. And there, that's a good example where you, you don't want to borrow for 20 years, you right. want to borrow for mean, three to five. Yeah. You know, feed their useful life. Yeah. So I, those sorts of things would be great to have other resources available. We just keep giving ARPA money from the feds. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. The next one, I think the next one is just an example of should the finance chair also have access to the municipal advisor? I think it says the finance director does. It was a little confusing to me the difference between a municipal advisor and the bond advisor. Is it the same person? I would say so. I, mean, I don't know. I can't differentiate between the two. Okay. I know they were like in there separately and defined slightly separately. And it seems like we have access to them. Yeah. But it just, this just reads like the finance director has access, but. I would think the intent there was to make sure the finance director was surrounding themselves with the appropriate professionals. Mm -hmm. That's it. I guess my next question kind of got to this point too, which was we talked about municipal advisor, bond council. Um, it says we approved the bond council as a council based on a recommendation that you guys give. But is that something that's supposed to happen? I don't know if it called out specifically like when we do that or how often we do that. Well, luckily we're with a large enough firm that has the expertise in house. Mm -hmm. So shout out to Wheeler, it's been a long standing fund council. Um, so this is not the gentleman who came in. No, he's a financial advisor. Okay. I think that's where I'm getting confused. There's different titles yeah. for different people. So yeah. I was thinking that was the guy who came. Yeah. But he was our bond counsel, not, not, not counsel Shannon. advisor. Okay. Counsel yeah. is a lawyer, and the lawyer's okay. responsibility is let's put it that um, on one hand, they're assuring that the, our, our process has been followed, our local process, in terms of getting to the point of issuance and all the appropriate. Legislative approvals and voter approvals have happened as required by the charter. So, to give the uh, the potential purchasers uh, the assurance that there's no no nothing gonna no hiccup coming down the road that you can buy these bonds with confidence that they were done lawfully. Right. She also makes sure uh, that we're adhering to all IRS and SEC uh, related matters. For instance, arbitrage we can borrow money tax exempted. Very cheap rates and invest it. It's going to be used within a very finite period of time for the intended purpose. So all that requires uh, legal oversight. Okay. John, was your question more about whether or not we approved that as a council and when? I think it was multiple. Like first was kind of who approved sure. it and trying to get clarity, but I think yeah. That because we definitely, I mean, we definitely need approve the auditor. You know, we need. Full council approval mm -hmm. just did that, took care of that. Um, but I don't ever remember 
I council think there was some um, council. It passed council, certainly approved on the sure of the town attorney. Mm -hmm. and, and again, because she's within that entity and has the expertise to serve in this capacity, mm -hmm. it's not to say we couldn't appoint someone other than that. Mm -hmm. So this is more just to say if for some reason we lost our council, you would bring before the town council a requirement that mm -hmm. we would have to include the new council. But our, our bond council is furnished and sure, not necessarily. Right. She has to be the one. She's the person yeah. that they they put in. But so we have a contract with them. And then when that contract comes up for renewal or whatever, that's mm -hmm. when we would kind of. Okay. Yeah. okay. That, that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. She's terrific, too. Yeah. We're lucky. She's yeah. great. We're lucky to have her. I really, she's fantastic. Yeah. Cool. Um, the investment policy again. I think this just goes back to our earlier conversation about calendar. Is it, I think there was a two-year, three-year review. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't sure when that was done last. Um, you can skip one twenty-six. Three twenty is really good. <laughs> yeah, one of the things. This was just like um, an observation, which to me makes sense, but just an observation for maybe future conversation that. Mm -hmm our investment profile for how we implement our investment policy is relatively low risk and conservative, which I think is fine. But I guess, it, you know, is there an appetite to kind of revisit that and make it like invest in more higher risk, higher return things? I don't know. This is like a big fund for us where we actually get a lot of investment. Fun yeah, but there's also a, a the liquidity piece is a real important mm -hmm. uh, component here in terms of it, it, it requires, and I don't even have the level of um, line of sight and insight in terms of when we need the money. Mm -hmm. So that, in in large part, plus the statutory limitations that we can and can't invest in, dictate the kind kind of investment vehicles that were even available to us. Okay. Um, I read this at the time when I was talking to a personal financial advisor and they're asking me all my questions and they're like, are you sure you want to invest in anything? Because you don't seem like you should probably put it in savings. And I'm like, that's my preference. <laughs> that's why. But I feel like I'm supposed to put money in an investment account. But so when I read that, I was like, this feels kind of conservative based on. So, I mean, the premise, you know, we're using these are public funds. So yeah. To, right. And sometimes the, the private funds are local investor mm -hmm. or what have you. So you need to make sure that the, that the asset is protected in that typically means low risk, yeah, conservative. So the lower returns to have liquidity is the. Way. And that liquidity also yeah. determines uh, the sort of investment vehicle that you can even contemplate. Okay. Think back, I'm dating myself 25 years ago or in the county of California with derivatives. Were some billions of dollars made uh, with risk investments and bankruptcies um, for cities and counties uh, came out of it. So a lot of these restrictions really fell out of that um, with abuses back then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, I think 28 was just a clarification. Or just my assumption was it looked like it happened. I assumed it happened in the budget process. So it seems like on these comments, we do this on an ad as needed basis. So, what's the question, John? So, when is that decision made for committee? Yeah. Uh, can we give a, should I give a more of example? We've got uh, fees that come in from the commercial fish care. Mm -hmm. And the council created a reserve fund that is limited in its use. So mm -hmm. the council created the fund and also defined what it can be used for. Mm -hmm. I think the same could be said for affordable housing initiative fund. Mm -hmm. uh, monies are placed there, but they are limited by definition the council's provided in terms of what they can be used for annually right yeah um well th those are kind of standing limitations so right. staff follows that directive uh we'll make recommendations for use of the funds so long as it complies with the need that you set mm -hmm. as opposed to simply fund balance money in the bank that is 
to be used for any purpose you wish. Okay. Uh, I think just just let me say for uh, just maybe this would be comfort. I can only spend the money that I'm authorized mm -hmm. to spend. Right. So the biggest authorization happens as part of the budget process. Yes. Um, beyond that, I don't, on occasion, I'll come to you and seek additional authorization for one reason or another. So uh, the con the council controls all yeah. of that. Um, so that's kind of what the as needed is. It's like yeah, when you come and say, I would like to make a change, and it goes to the council. Or I'd like to I, yeah, we'll exactly. draw eventually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's going to be a misconception that I've got all sorts of authority special, and money that we're special, oh, yeah. you, you, <laughs> you give me the authority to kind of meter it out on a as needed basis you know, mm -hmm. to name a budget process or you know, if I need. So line 29 again, I, I remember this came up during the budget process where again, we talked about different mm -hmm. similar types of equipment. Some seem similar enough, but we're on different replacement schedules. So it's just, I'm just so curious to better understand what the rules are by department. Because again, yeah. even from a budget perspective, when we're looking at the CIP, we may want to look at some things in the future to decide, well, maybe we could push that out another year. Maybe, no, we've overdone that one mm -hmm. and we need to pull it back in. So I just felt like that would be. Yeah, there's no the overall systems. We've got a brand new fire chief who, uh, who was. Choosing to dive deep into that and maybe coming forward with a different perspective than his predecessor had. Uh, but the big goal is public works and, and fire department, and that's where the big expense of equipment is. Each have a very well established system. And the general rule there is you keep equipment, one, we, we're aware of what the industry standards and expectations are. But we also like to uh, keep equipment or move it along uh, before it starts to cost us significant money for, from a maintenance point of view. And while it still has some trigger value. Mm -hmm. And so these schedules have been developed with uh, maintenance, with maintenance staff, uh, with decades of kind of experience with a different kind of rolling stock. And then, mm -hmm. but also you get from the fire trucks, but you know, fire trucks. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Either used and other used. Again, yeah, for these for different purposes. So I'm pleased we could have a couple of sessions or one. The long one uh, with <laughs> public works and, and fire departments that people do keep understanding of their their schedules. And I assure you, I question them every year when I see the requests come in. Can we squeeze it in a year? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes we can, and sometimes we can't. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting to have been on the board and have a different perspective because the school board, you know, equipment, their big ones are school buses. Yeah. And they have those on. A you know very strict schedule. Kate knows exactly which buses need to be retired, but she still brings those because yeah. it's just one department, right? So because as a board member, you get to have oversight into that mm -hmm. one department. We always saw those great capital yeah. requests coming to us. Whereas I envision a lot of times Tom says, "Hey, what about this? What about this?" Before it reaches the okay. level of the right. council. Right. Let's take that one out. Yeah. That one out. Exactly. Yeah. And maybe sometimes to your detriment, Tom, um, because you don't get credit for <laughs> Just bring it all in. That's okay. <laughs> um, the next one was around the long range facilities plan. I think Tom kind of hit on this earlier about mm -hmm. capital planning. And I think when I read the actual long range facilities plan, I did note that it excluded school capital. And I again, like I'm just They're not purposeful, more... they were the funds that you might request. Yeah. <laughs> So I think I think given the, the school project, again, going forward, it would be good to have a consolidated long range facilities plan that includes their needs, especially from a capital planning perspective. Um, and again, that, that goes back I think, to one of my comments at the very beginning, where it was like not always clear, like, are these supposed to be town wide, including library school, SEDCO policy, or is this just town policy, because again, I just assumed the long range facilities plan because we manage the debt as part of our, like it's automatic, but it should be part of our plan. I totally get we need to partner with the school on it because they should own their aspects of the plan, mm -hmm. but if we're going to create a long range plan, it would be good to have that. And I remember, I think it was this year, you had initially requested doing 
something similar to this or some sort of like facilities assessment? Uh, well, Todd's nearing the end of a uh, facility maintenance plan for all park facilities. Okay. Those related things. Um, no, in, in this plan, I don't know that I'll do it that way again, but we, we put things into three different buckets, short term, medium term, and long term, and we defined what that meant. One of three, I think, three to five, seven plus, or something like that. And so it wasn't terribly detailed, but it was with a school, uh, did everything kind of within the same document and mm -hmm. started to establish a pecking order. Mm -hmm. um, that's a large part of how this building emerged in front of the library. Yeah. And we kind of fell back in behind it. So I think it's long overdue. Yeah, this goes back to your earlier comment about the library has been doing stuff for a very long time. And all of it started probably even before this, but this was kind of when they got, when they knew mm -hmm. it would be in the five, seven year mark or whatever. Yeah. Out there together. I think it's about mandating expectations for the public and for, you know, we, let's face it, internally we have some competing priorities. Like yeah. What, what is, what is the overall priority? Not everyone would agree. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think it's a helpful process to follow for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's challenging because sometimes we say, well, the school is a department of the town. And then sometimes we say, well, the school governs that portion of mm -hmm. their operations. And we try and have a gentle touch on that. So mm -hmm. it, you know, when when we're trying to set expectations, it depends on what we're holding ourselves accountable to and what we're holding the school accountable to. Yeah. I just wonder what uh what they to do so that. I was thinking back to the exercise that we attempted this summer leading up to the council decision on the, on the library referendum, which is we've got these other things kind of slightly in the darkness, but soon to come forward, we should be considering all of them. You know, a, a well done and thoughtful long range plan is likely to look 20 years out and have some big numbers. And mm -hmm. so I wonder what the expectations are of a document like that. that kind of, um, very rough estimates of cost mm -hmm. and, and timelines that can fly. So I'm just kind of wondering out loud yeah. what the follow up expectations are. Yeah. <laughs> and there's stuff we can't anticipate too, because that's what we know today, but nobody has a crystal ball to know like what the needs are going to be five years from now, 10 years from now, that could really change stuff. But. Or an opportunity presents itself. So yeah. the project gets faulted much sooner than you thought it would, or you combine projects. And mm -hmm. so I think it's like it's a guide to your point. Like you mm -hmm. should hopefully frame it as a guide. And then the other parts of the guide are our fiscal policy debt metrics that need to go with it so that when we make a decision to move something, we're showing that it's still within our mm -hmm. our metrics of what we should be doing from a debt management perspective. But to me that's like how you justify moving things. Um, but with the school, I don't even know, to your point, like when this plan was put together, what would have gone in there for the school at that point? If it was back, if it was six years ago, that might have even been before. It would have been, been reinvesting, I think, in the three Yeah, yeah. And, and, and with the potential thinking. for a fourth. But that was really just conceptual. Yeah, I don't think you even engaged years years ago. You know what that meant. Yeah. But even if you look at like, the costs today, like yeah. I don't know if anybody would have anticipated there, there would not have been a, any placeholder near what. Yeah, it would have been you know, way off. No, yeah. just yeah. think about it. I, in April, tell me if I'm wrong. I think the only reason that the school project doesn't appear in the current five year CFP, I mean, we all knew that it's an active conversation we've been funding it um, quite a lot, is that they were hesitant to fix a number to it. They didn't have that number at the time, you know, early last spring. They did not have that number. Um, I remember even when you and I started last fall. Mm -hmm. um, we pushed for a number yeah. and requested that they try and get one in. I think it's unfortunate because they they got one in July and had they, you know, had a little bit more time. I think if they wanted a number that they could be confident in, right? Yeah, and not just put out I, something. Yeah, and, and you know, for something that's several years out, uh, you know, budget is your best guess. Yeah, and, and I know that people are 
it, it's more important to get it in the system and on paper and in the in the queue, so to speak, than getting that number right. Yeah. yeah. So that's probably a good lesson learned. Yeah. Uh, let's do our best. Yeah. So it's not underestimate or mm -hmm. overestimate. Let's do the best we can, but it's still a lesson. Yeah. I did. I do remember I asked the question in the finance committee review with them, and I could see, like, I was like, I don't know if I should ask this, but I'm asking it because I felt like we needed to. And I think retrospect, not just asking it, but saying we need to put a number. Like, I feel like we should have. Yeah. Just said, you know, order of magnitude. Absolutely, on put something in. So, so. Mm -hmm. so we did. We did bring it up. We just we did allow them. We didn't. We didn't like push it. Like I, I think in retrospect we should have. So I think we could have done that. Have we effectively transitioned into this was, process yeah. to modify? The <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think so. I think so. Uh, the reality is we don't have a a, a, a written process per se. I mean, the practice that I pretty consistently done is included a five-year, I'll call it a capital plan as part of the annual budget. And typically uh, things progress through, sometimes they fall off, sometimes new ones come on, um, but there's fairly good consistency. You can kind of look back through the whole budget and see how things progress through. Um, so that's really the one and only time that we produce a, a document for the public and for certainly the council's review and consideration. But even that consideration is really in year one of the year of the five year plan. Mm -hmm. It's about what do you need for next year? Because um, that's you know that's what that's the bottom line, so to speak. Um, that's not to say we can't do something outside of the budget process, but that's just the way it's been historically. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think we're so close now. I don't know. I don't know that there'd be much value in kind of doing that. Before we make uh, you know, the next year's budget proposal in March, we don't. Again, when because in the budget order, we do approve the capital improvement or yes, capital budget, but not the CIP, correct? Not the plan. Yeah, you approve yeah. the capital budget, and it's essentially it's just the blue, right? That's blue, right? It's it's the first year of a five year plan. Mm -hmm. We don't really have a formal mechanism or policy to say, is the five year plan the five year plan that we're committing to? Right. Right. Yeah. But I'm not sure if you need to. Um, and I'm not sure if I'd recommend that you do that because things do change. Yeah. And I typically have a lot of influence uh, with at least my staff in terms of where those out years, what falls in those out years. Mm -hmm. That's where. Um, you will sort of talk about what's in year one, but there's some flexibility to kind of push things out um, to level on, level things out if you will. Is it is it safe to say like if you were to take the five year plans from the past five years and look at them that things are just so fluid and changing? Or no, are we pretty? I would, I don't know, I would, that's 90, no, sorry, 70% of it, kind of, you'll follow for projection, what was year five, is now year four, it's kind of marches yeah. in, the numbers will get refined, yeah. you know, if it gets closer, we're spending a little more time, they're not big estimates, there is, you know, it's much more refined, mm -hmm. but then there's some flexibility, whether it's things that I put my finger on and push out, or, and then things happen. Mm -hmm. um, that would cause a project to get delayed or accelerated. But I think this is what people have been thirsting for, which is kind of tell us what's coming at us. Yeah. And let's be thoughtful about how can we manage this uh, within our resources and our abilities. And the strategy we use, and I think this is like a source of some confusion and frustration, is we try to manage the annual debt service fairly positive. And it's if it represents between 12 and 13 percent of uh, operating costs, that avoids any big spikes uh, in our tax rate. Mm -hmm. And as this community grows, our ability, you know, that percentage grows, obviously, and, and our current growth pattern and projected growth pattern evaluation suggests we've got some pretty significant capacity going forward. Mm -hmm. um, what that effectively means is that we since I've been here, we've been hovering around $100 million in debt almost consistently. And we can go up and down, but more times than not, we're pushing $100 million in debt. Mm -hmm. And it sounds a lot, and it is a lot, 
but the size of this community and its growth potential, well, I think we've demonstrated the fact that we can manage that without um, huge hardship. Mm -hmm. Just look at our consistency in terms of tax rate, I think. I think it's pretty small. Well, on the one hand, I, I can hear we're very close to the budget cycle. We just rectify the fact that the school's not in the CIP. When it comes around this year, we put in our best guess figure from the school, whatever it is that they arrive at during their budget process. If that's a little bit different than numbers we've heard or not, I don't know. But my concern around that is that it just kind of fuels the narrative that, well, why are we discussing this? It's not even in the plan. Yeah. I don't think there's any harm. So this is where it should show. Yeah. It would be in the facility category, presumably, of, of this sheet. Somewhere here. So would this be like a formal action for the school board to say if they wanted to resubmit or update or amend their five-year plan right. that they would send it to the council and the council, like, what would that mean in terms of our policy and approach is that just like a one-time order request that we just all unanimously approve or yeah, I, I could serve a purpose by the school board being very clear what their expectations are i don't know if the council would need to do anything with it i suppose you could if you wish mm -hmm. but, but you really don't ever adopt this plan okay yeah so um, right it. anyway but they do so like i'm assuming right does this, right. the school board adopt a formally adopt a five-year capital plan I guess it's not. It's probably similar to what they look at year one of the five years. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So. See, that's where this gets tricky. Is it, it was never a formal action, so then to amend it, mm -hmm. requiring a formal action, seems weird and, and a little bit out of place. But at the same time, I don't think that there's any harm or shock or surprise from anyone that they. That the school should have been represented and we should rectify that. Yeah. What's the downside of doing nothing until the, the budget submission in February? Again, it's the I guess, worst kept secret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I guess the downside know. is we see an omission and we failed to correct it. Mm -hmm. Well, I could talk to the yeah, to my yeah. colleagues in the school to see um, what they actually, the actual the DOE actually does with the five year with the their five year plan, and at the very least they can clearly state for the council's purpose and the public's purpose what their intentions are yeah. and expectations. We have the workshop tomorrow, so it could just yeah, be something, and we have the committee afterwards, so yeah. we can just ask them. As well in tonight's meeting. I'll catch up with, with, with Jeff and Diane tomorrow before mm -hmm. and we can certainly speak to it. Yeah. Any other questions about that? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Tom, for yeah. entertaining yeah. your discussion. Yeah. Um, any other um, kind of closing remarks on our discussion from the um, finance policy today, John? No, I mean, I, I think there's some good areas for the next committee to explore. I was, I'm surprised that some of the other counselors, I know we made this open to everyone. I, I like I said. <laughs> well, you was in your, but you, you you did your homework, but I, I expected to see some stuff from, from a few of the other counselors, but it might just be like given everything else they have yeah. at the time. So yeah. depending on what the makeup is of the next finance committee, they also might want to yeah. have this as a first action to just review the policy. Yeah. And ask questions if they have any before things get kicked off. That could like actually check the block right because we're supposed to do this annually. So yeah. first order of business for the new committee is to review the fiscal policy and just make sure that they've reviewed it, add other questions, and then hopefully hone in on any specific things that may be worth. Yeah, and then exploring. potentially come up with some specific action for Tom. Um, yeah, we'll keep the Google sheet open. I, I know Don and John. Um, access to it. Yeah. Um, so you can open 
сейчас, я думаю, будет меньше. Okay. Um, with that, I will go ahead and open it up for uh, public comment. I just uh, this is the first finance committee meeting that I've attended. So I was just le learning the, the process. And I, I, I guess my only comment would be a uh, hundred million dollars in debt. So that's kind of my, uh, I would say just because we can afford it, we don't, you know, don't take on debt, we don't need to. As an individual, I, I worked, and my wife worked very hard to get out of debt. Uh, I had an interesting comment from a banker recently that we kind of talked to him. And the comment was made that the younger generation doesn't ever plan to be out of debt. I found that an interesting comment. Can you state your name for the public record? No problem. Thank you. Public I, comment this evening? I, uh, Martin Gates. Uh, very interesting to be here. Uh, I suppose in some, some summation of my comment. I have a suggestion about you know, the conversation about process and video uh, of process of a, a, a small manual entitled process for dummies <laughs> one of the public perceptions i think is and it's only my opinion is that for example in the recent library um, there were people who understood the process and all the nuances and all of the eddies in the process. And then there were the rest of us uh, in a certain sense. And, and if there's more transparency there, I hope we can avoid a lot of roadblocks or, mm -hmm. you know, attempted minds that somebody is trying to slow things down or for understanding. So, and um, I had a couple of questions that was appropriate. Yeah. Um, the unassigned fund balance determination, where do you want to be in that? I take it that's the council. If the council wanted to decide we want X as opposed to Y, they have that authority. Okay, I mean, that seems like a no-brainer. Okay. Um, and growth consistency, this may be out of my lead a little bit, but I heard the town manager say growth consistency, that there's been good consistency in growth, and that's reflected in or based on the tax rate. I, any sense or I think the is there I, any other basis? It was my question. And is fund balance on the side fund balance another basis for determining? And this isn't a trick question. Sure. This is the, var the variable of having a consistent tax rate. I completely get. Are there any other variables in determining? The uh, strength of the growth. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. yeah, go for it. So, I think that's where when we had our bond advisor come, and even in our fiscal policy, there's a list of metrics that we try and target. And so, they did provide all of the key things we should be looking at to evaluate our fiscal health, our ability to borrow, and maintain our, our rating. And again, I think my recollection from that conversation when I asked specifically on the which metrics are the ones that are the ones we can improve on most, that's where the unassigned fund balance from their perspective was that's probably an opportunity to better strengthen. But as Tom said, mm -hmm. the you know, 
benefit we get from that, from going from one rating to the next, might be minimal. So that's where the council has some discretion of is it worth it, is it not worth it? And I think there's other factors that come into play. But I think from what I recall from the meeting, we were doing very, very well across all metrics, including things like um, I don't know if it was like debt per capita, but there was something in there about debt per our valuation or something. So it's all in our fiscal policy. I should probably know the top of my head at this point, but we do have an appendix in there that has all the metrics. Where is it? Well, you've answered my question. Yeah, there, 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 there are multiple uh, measures. measures. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I would just simply offer the, the uh, consistency and the, uh, of the tax rate predictability really isn't much of a matter or concern with rating agencies. Um, they know right. that, they that the council has the full full faith in taxing authority, they could they could quadruple that. Um, that's all they care about. Mm -hmm. I think it's hugely important for the public. And so the the challenge is to try to satisfy the predictability and the comfort and affordability for our residents by keeping the tax rate as low as possible and as predictable as possible. It's at the expense of building up some of these other um items like fund balance. Yeah. And the other part of, the other part that I took away from the advisor too, which is a huge part of our measures of success, is also tied into the projected valuation growth yeah. of the community, which is also yeah. impacted by what our policy is around growth yeah. overall. And so this is the balance of if we were to arbitrarily and really slow down growth, there could be some financial impact yeah. that could impact potentially not probably not highly likely at least today, but like down the road to impact our bond rating because if we're not growing at a certain clip, that's my understanding is that the bond advisors are looking at that or the bond agencies are looking at that and they might say, you guys aren't growing at a certain pace, you're not your value is not growing, we're gonna drop your bond rating, which could increase our debt load mm -hmm. that we then have to pass on to taxpayers right. that would have that same implication. Yeah, and the, the valuation also affects existing taxpayers. So uh, you get new people helping to pay our bill, existing bills, and some new bills to, to deal with the growth demands. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, certainly a way in the last several decades we've been able to keep that rate more stable because we've got new value of other people to help pay the bills, so to speak. So there's a consequence to the slowing that growth and, and valuation growth. Mm -hmm. New people could add to the cost of the they, could, yeah. they could, and I think the conversation we've had right along and need to continue having is that not all growth is created equal. You know, we, 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 I think, have come to appreciate what certain types of even residential growth will mean to us, mm -hmm. and some is very net positive. You know, a good return on the investment, they pay more in taxes than it costs to provide services, and others, not so much. Um, and, and certainly commercial investor is a different animal altogether. So I think being thoughtful around what sort of growth and where you're encouraging it is a real important part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. It just makes this whole thing more complicated. It does. Yeah. But then, yeah. It does. Yeah. I counted three balls in here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure but they're all interrelated. Yeah. yeah. And that's the takeaway here. Right? Mm -hmm. And I have one more comment and it's very brief. Um, I'm going to call you Tom. Tom Please. You said, uh, uh, what's the downside? Or ask the question, what's the downside in relationship to the school of uh, uh, waiting for the budget? Again, my pers my opinion, only my opinion, perception of the body politic or something like that. Leadership. Any demonstration the council were to say we need this as opposed to leaving it up to in, in a nebulous area uh, that would be uh, great mm -hmm. great thank you very much gentlemen uh with that i will go ahead and ask for to adjourn. Mm -hmm. second all those in favor great Thank you, everybody. Thank you.